morning. It's good to be back here. I'm very happy to be back with you this Sabbath. It's been a couple years, and I said, well, I got an invitation to come back. That means we are family. <laughs> so I I'm glad to be here. And, you know, I thought about something. I said, the last time I came and I, I shared my testimony, do you know God blessed me? Some of you might already know, but he blessed us with another addition, little Miss Sydney um, over there. So that's a whole other testimony. But I just want to give God glory and let you guys know that he expanded our family since the last time that we were here that we were here. But today, I want to start off by telling you a story about a woman who had superpowers, okay? Now, like anybody who possesses supernatural power, this woman could do some mysterious things, okay? Now, she couldn't fly through the sky and have people look out and say, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's super. Superwoman. No, that wasn't her superpower. Nor could she take her eyes and look at somebody and turn them into ice. That wasn't her power either. Her power, in my opinion, was much greater than that. Because this woman could cause people to do exactly what she wanted them to do. And the thing about this power was it was so powerful that it didn't just impact the person that she used her power on. It impacted people around them and people associated with them. So how did this woman get her power? Well, as the story is told, when she was born, her father gave her this gift. And this gift was a superpower. But he gave it to her with two conditions. First condition being, this gift cannot be unwrapped and used until the daughter reached the age of maturity. The second condition was that when she used the power, she had to first talk to her father so he could give her instructions and help her you know, navigate how to use what he had given her. Now, these conditions were given to her not because the father didn't trust her, but because the father understood that the power that he was giving her was so powerful that if she used it in the wrong way, or if it fell into the wrong hands, or if she was influenced by the wrong person, this power could be deadly. So, as the daughter grew and she reached the age of maturity, the day arrived when she was able to open the gift. And she was excited. But just like a young person who learns how to drive at first, you know, she was real cautious with the gift. She only used her power a little bit, and she always talked to her father and got his advice and help on how to use it. And as time went on, she got more comfortable with the gift, and she started to use it more and do more powerful things with it, until eventually she wasn't even talking to her father about using the gift anymore. She was doing her own thing. Then one day, as the father was looking out the window, he saw his daughter about to use her power on an unsuspecting individual. And by her disposition, he could tell that she was about to do something that was not good. So he cried out, remember my instructions. And his daughter stood there holding this unbelievable power in her hands. And she had a decision to make. Would she follow her own inclinations and use this power on this person for evil? Or would she listen to her father and use the power he had given her the way he wanted her to? Would she be a superhero, or would she be a supervillain? Women of Pisda, the choice is up to you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm asking you right now to fill this place. We've talked about this message, Lord. Now I need you to speak through me today, all of you, none of me. In your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now I just want to read this. Let's read the scripture reading for today one more time. Genesis 16, verse 2. Genesis 16, verse 2, and I'll read it in your hearing. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. 
It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. The title of my message today is A Woman and Her Superpowers. Now, we live in a time where everywhere you look, in the media, on the movies, where superheroes, superpowers, there's all kinds of movies about superheroes. Like, we are fascinated with this concept of superheroes. I Googled it, and do you know that there are, I think they said 21, Marvel has put out 21 movies on superheroes, and they have 10 more that are currently in the making. We are living in a society that is obsessed with superheroes and superpowers. And I'm here to tell you that I believe that it is a very crafty agenda created and designed by the enemy to distract us from the real battle that's going on with the real superheroes and the real supervillains. Now, what you have to understand is this. I, I looked up, I said, what is a superhero? So I, I went to my assistant, Google, again. And Google told me that a superhero is a fictional character who possesses superpowers, and they use these powers to fight the evil in their universe. I was like, okay, fair. And I said, but no, I think there's a better definition. A superhero is not a fictional character, but it is an individual who possesses supernatural powers given to them by the source of all power, and they use that power to fight the evil of our universe. That's the definition of a superhero. So today, I want to talk to you about the supernatural power that God has given each and every woman. Now here's the thing, whether you use it or not, God still gave you the power. Whether you use it for his glory or not, he still gave you the power. Every woman in this place has supernatural power that God has given them. Now, it's Women's Day, and we don't want to leave the brothers out. God has given you supernatural powers, too. So what you need to do is invite a speaker to come talk to you guys about that. <laughs> but today, it's all about the ladies, OK? So we're going to focus on our superpower. So this superpower. If we want to know what it is, we have to go back to the beginning, okay? So let's go back to the beginning of time and see what power God gave women. So let's turn to Genesis 2.18. You guys are familiar with this verse. We're talking about creation. We know the creation story. God created all these wonderful things. He says they're good. He creates Adam in Genesis 2.18. God says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet. Hmm. So women were created to be help meets. What was God thinking when he said that? What type of help was he talking about women giving men? Let's just think about this. Did he, I mean, as women, we help them, we can cook, we can clean, we can raise children, we can do... Is that the type of help God was talking about? Possibly, could be. But I think God's a little deeper than just physical help, right? As we as women, we do a lot of things. And so I said, okay, God, how can we figure out what type of help men were gonna need? So I said, let me start going back to my assistant, Google. And I found some interesting things. Now I'll tell you. When I was doing this research, it was early in the morning. I was in my bed. My husband was laying next to me. And as I was finding out these, these things, I was sitting in the bed like, mm, that's the truth. I, I, I knew it. I knew it. So when I share with you something that you already knew, go ahead and say, mm, okay, ladies. And, and to the brothers, again, these are just statistics. It does not mean it applies to everybody. It's a generalization, okay? The first thing I discovered in my research, and I was like, whoa, according to a study of IQ tests from around the world, women have higher IQs than men. Mmm. I said, I know that. I looked at him, I said, oh, I know that. I know it. We have higher IQs than men. Then I got to another study, a study from San Diego State University. And they studied offices across the U.S. And they found that men's desks and offices are germier than women's. 
researchers discovered that men had anywhere from 10 to 20% more bacteria in their workspaces. And they said it's because men tend to be less hygienic. We're like, okay. Then diet. A survey of more than 14,000 people conducted by the University of Minnesota came back and they said men are more likely to choose red meat and frozen pizzas while women are looking for fruits and vegetables. And as a result, women tend to be healthier than men. Then there was a study by the University of Georgia and Columbia University, and they found that women are better learners. Now, do you know why they said that? We listen. <laughs> we know how to listen. Then there was another study that came across, and it was called the Moral DNA Test. And this test suggested that women are more moral than men. And it said that it's because women are more likely when they make decisions to take into consideration the feelings of others. And as a result, they make moral decisions, more moral decisions. Now, those are interesting things, right? Brothers, there are a lot of things that you, well, maybe not a lot. There are some things that you guys do better than us, but we're talking about the ladies. And I, I continued, I said, okay, now what is this, how does this work into the help meet thing? Harvard Medical School did a study, and this is what they came out and said. Married men are healthier than men who were never married or men who were divorced or who are widowed. Never married men were three times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than married men. And a report from Framingham Offspring Study suggested that marriage is truly heartwarming because scientists evaluated 3,682 adults over a 10-year period. And they said even after taking the major cardiovascular risk into consideration, men that were married had a 46% less chance of having heart disease. Then, even if you get sick, they talked about cancer, they said unmarried individuals were more likely to have advanced disease at the time of diagnosis. Married, unmarried patients were less likely to receive treatment than married patients. But even among the people who received cancer therapy, marriage was linked to improved survival. So there is something that women are doing that's helping our men live longer, healthier, stronger, and better lives. So it's like, okay, God, God knew what he was doing. There's something that women are doing. So women, how are we doing this? Has any woman in here ever took a man, strapped him to a seat, and then took a spoon and just forced him to eat some vegetables? Is that how you do it? Oh, we have somebody. <laughs> Is that how we do it? No. So it's like we're not forcing them. There's something else that we're doing that's helping men live these better lives. And I want to suggest to you today that the superpower that God gave us is influence. It's influence. Now, a good example of this, I'll tell you the story, is found in the Bible. And here you have David. He's in the wilderness, okay? He's in the wilderness with a crew of roughnecks. We're just going to call them what they are. They are roughnecks, okay? He's, he's gathered all these men. They, they're fighters. You know, they're vagabonds. They are connected to David. And the reason they're connected to David is because David is the greatest roughneck of them all, okay? Let's be real. Let's think about who King David or soon-to-be King David was. When Saul was like, okay, David, is, he's, he's out here fighting battles and causing me to lose my popularity. I got to get rid of this boy. What did Saul do? He put together a strategic plan to kill David. And that plan was a supposed suicide mission. He says, David, you can have my daughter. All I need you to do is go out there and kill 100 Philistines and bring me back their foreskins as proof. And so David, when he heard this, he was like, go out and kill 100? Man, don't you know I kill the Lord's enemies for sport. Let's make it 200. And David went out. And he did the job. He's rough. He's tough. He's a fighter. He's a warrior. So while they're out in the wilderness, his men are hungry. And he's like, I've been protecting this man, Nabal, for many years. Let me, for a long time. I don't know if it was years, but I've been protecting him. Surely he'll give my boys some food. 
So he picks out 10 of his men, and he sends them. He says, go talk to the man Nabal. Tell him everything we've been doing, and ask him, can he spare some food for us? So the men go. And when they reach Nabal, don't you know some interesting things happen? Because the men tell Nabal, you know, we're with David, and this is what's happening. Can you please, you know, help us out with some food because we've been protecting you? And Nabal's like, David, David, who? There are a lot of runaway servants and slaves around here. How do I know David's not just one of them trying to benefit off of me? Not going to happen. So picture this. I'm imagining that David's men are sitting there like, really? Okay, okay. Let me say this again. David, son of Jesse, anointed David, the one who killed Goliath. That's the David I'm talking about. Do you know who I'm talking about? I said what I said. My water, my food, my bread, he ain't getting none of it. And so David's men went back to David and delivered the message. Now you can only imagine how David responded. But really you don't have to imagine because the Bible makes it very clear. David was like, okay, bet. Picked up his sword, 400 of y'all, come on, we going. And he said, may the Lord deal with me ever so severely if by the morning every man in Nabal's house is not dead. See, David wasn't about that. Let's talk about it. He gave you one opportunity. You made the wrong choice. Okay, talking is over. I'm a warrior. That's it. So here you have David. This, he's angry. He's in a rage. And you have 400 men probably hyping them up. They're like, yeah, let's go get him. Headed toward Nabal. And God is like, Ugh. David, you my boy. I mean, I picked you because you're rough and tough, but I did not pick you to fight your own battles. I picked you to fight the battles that I have chosen for you to fight, my battles. I'll take care of you. So God's looking, he's like, who can I get to stop this boy? He looks to the soldiers, nah. Then he says, you know what? This isn't a job for a man. This is a job for a superwoman. And in comes Abigail. Now, Abigail has wisdom. She's like, okay, God, you've given me this superpower. I'm about to use it. Guide me in using it. So Abigail goes to meet and enrage David. And remember, the last thing David said is, I'm killing everybody, every man. And Abigail, with her supernatural power, approaches David. Pardon me, my Lord. I'm sorry for what's happened. But I hope you didn't pay too much attention to what The fool, Nabal said. He's a fool. I mean, literally, his name means fool. And while she's talking, she's like, get the food to them. She's summoning the men. They start delivering the food to David's men. And she says, and I'm so thankful that the Lord has kept you from bloodshed. And I know that the Lord will make a great lasting dynasty out of you because you do no wrong in his sight. So David is sitting there like, Ang- I mean, he is, he is disturbed now. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. His mission to kill Nabal and his men all of a sudden falls to the wayside. Now, I want you to think how, about how Abigail, Abigail excuse me, just worked David over. The first thing she did, she told him Nabal's a fool, right? She's letting David know that Nabal is not worth your time. The second thing she does is she speaks into existence with faith, what she wants to see happen. David did not say he wasn't coming to kill anybody. He is there with his knot, ready to kill somebody. She said, I'm so glad that the Lord has kept you from bloodshed. She worked it over on him, just got into his head. And then she said, the Lord will make a lasting dynasty out of you. She reminded David of his purpose. And you tell me, what kind of man wouldn't want a woman like that by his side? Someone who will keep him from making mistakes, foolish ones. Someone who will remind him of his purpose. And someone who will speak faith into his life to see what she wants to happen, because she's in line with God, for this man. And so by the time she was through with David, David had dropped his sword. He had raised his hand. He started praising the Lord for this woman, this superwoman, who had kept him from making a terrible mistake. And you know how the story goes? God's taking care of us. He handled Nabal because Nabal, you know, 10 days later, God took him out because Nabal was out of line. 
But you know what David did? He said, Abigail, I'm sorry. I, I know your man just died, but what you say about getting with me? And Abigail became David's wife because David saw the value in the wisdom of Abigail. But here's the thing. Every woman that possesses a supernatural power does not use it for good. Everybody's not a superhero. There are some super villains out there. Now let's talk about King Solomon. Honestly, you guys, I mean, I read so many Bible verses. I'm, when you read the Bible, aren't you just floored with some of the stuff that you read? I am floored. And this is one of those stories that just, it boggles my mind, but it shows you the power of the enemy and why we have to be always on top of stuff. Here you have Solomon, David's son, the one who was raised to be the next king of Israel, the son of a man after God's own heart. And Solomon is the one who went to God. God said, what do you want? And, God said, and Samuel said, I mean Samuel, Solomon said, I just want wisdom. So here you have the wisest man that ever walked the earth, the wisest human outside of Jesus, ever walked the earth. Do you know what he did when he got older? We know what he did. I think it's 1 Kings, 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings 11 Verse 4. 1 Kings 11, verse 4. This is a man who never had to fight because God said, you don't have to fight. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to make everything fine for you. I'll give you money. I'll give you riches. Anything you want, I'm going to give you because you found favor in my sight. But 1 Kings 11, chapter, 1 Kings 11 verse 4 says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And the chapter goes on to talk about how he built up altars. He starts worshiping these false gods. And it makes you wonder, how in the world, Solomon, you had communication with God and you saw the evidence of your prayers. God gave you wisdom. He gave you everything. And you, the wisest man on the planet, turns to an idol made by man's hands and start giving it honor and glory? That's the power of a woman. But Solomon's wives weren't the only ones. You know, Delilah, she worked Samson over. I mean, Samson went into that thing eyes wide open. She let you know, I am setting you up. He's like, okay. And he just kept going back, going back, going back, going back. What in the world? King Ahab, Jezebel, you are the king of Israel, and this woman has you killing prophets, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and you see God punishing you, but you still don't wake up out of your stupor, the power of a woman. So you might be thinking, okay, Simona, what's this have to do with me? I'm a good Christian woman. I've drawn my line in the sand, and I know that I am on God's side, I'm not a Jezebel, I'm not Solomon's wives, I'm not a Delilah. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But I want to tell you about Sarah. Because there are women who are on God's side, right? But sometimes they step on the other side and use their superpower on the enemies. And they come back. Then they step back over and they come back. And what's dangerous about this is that the woman who uses her superpowers to fight evil, she knows what she's doing. She's on God's side, clear, it's black and white. The woman who uses her superpowers to fight against good, she knows what she's doing. Delilah knew what she was doing. I'm on the enemy side and I'm proud of it. But the woman who says they're on God's side but tends to use her powers for the enemy, there's a problem. And that's what we want to dig into today. So Sarah... Sarah is sitting at home, and she's thinking, thinking about her life, thinking about the things that she wanted to happen that didn't happen, thinking about the things that she wanted that did happen. And as she's sitting there reflecting on her life, she comes to the conclusion that, you know what? I'm not going to sit back and let life just happen to me. I'm about to take life by the horns and make some things happen for myself. You know what? No more pity parties. I'm about to do something about my situation. And so she gets up, and she goes, and she finds her husband, and she's like, 
baby, let me talk to you. You know, life has been good, and there's been some things that we've wanted and things that haven't happened in our life, and I'm like, you know what? It's enough is enough. It's time for us to make some decisions and to do some things. And then she whispers in his ear, and she tells him. And he responds, you want me to do what? And she was like, yes, I said what I said, but God, baby, don't but God me. I mean, come on. Sometimes you have to look at the hard facts. The fact is women my age don't have babies. That's the fact. The fact is we've been waiting, 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 and nothing has happened. That's the fact. Yes, we trust God. But there are some things that God just can't do, or maybe he just doesn't choose to do. So it's time for us to be proactive, okay? All that God stuff, that's fine. But let's put things in perspective. Let's get a reality check. Now, I want you to go into Hagar's tent, handle your business, don't enjoy it, and I, I mean don't enjoy it, <laughs> but handle your business, and this time next year, we'll have our baby. It won't come through me, I accept that, but it will be our baby, our promised child. And then Abraham goes out to commit one of the most infamous faithless acts written in the Bible because of the influence of a woman. Now, we don't want to beat up on Sarah, right? Because I'm sure many of us have been where Sarah is. Life is tough. Waiting on God is tough. Not knowing what's happening next, not being able to see past the fog, and sometimes you feel like you have to take life by the horns and do something. So we, I don't want to say that Sarah was wrong because of her lack of faith, right? She did have a lack of faith, but I think her greater error was the fact that she did not do something about her lack of faith, okay? Because you have to remember, when, when Jesus was talking to the father whose child was demon-possessed, the man said, Lord, I believe. Sarah believed God, right? She believed him enough. She didn't believe him enough. <laughs> but he's like, Lord, I believe Help my unbelief. And that's where Sarah dropped the ball. It's okay to be shaky in your faith, but you got to know where to go so you can stand tall in your faith, right? And that's where Esther, that's where Esther did the right thing. Because I see that Esther is very similar. She's not that far off from Sarah, and here's why. Because when the whole thing went down with Esther, and she gets this message from Mordecai, right, that we're about to be killed, this terrible crisis is coming, what did Esther say? Did she say, yes, I am ready, I'm going before the king, and I'm going to handle this, don't you worry. Is that what she said? No, she did not say that, and I actually want us to read what she If you're in Esther's position, your husband has not talked to you or called for you in 30 days, and the last time you knew of a, king, of a queen doing something that was against the law, per se, and he was in front of his friends, he made an example out of her. And that time it went sending, him, sending her away. But this time the stakes are much higher. And her going before him could embarrass him, depending on his mood, and the stakes were high. So Esther said, okay, I got to go pray. Now, the Bible does not say that she prayed. It said that she called a fast. But if we think about the culture of that time, a fast goes hand in hand with praying. And Esther understood that this isn't something, okay, Lord, be with me before I go before him. No, I need some days of prayer for this one, because this thing is big. I need you to help me use my superpower to accomplish your will. So Esther goes before God, and then she's ready to go before the king. And see, this is why it is so important that we seek God in prayer before we use our powers. Because notice, when Esther went before him, she didn't have to say anything. The Holy Spirit spoke. The Holy Spirit said, pull out your scepter. He pulled out the scepter. And at that moment, Esther could have been like, oh my gosh, dear king, this is what's happening. He's trying to kill me. That meant, no. Esther didn't say a word because God had told her how to handle this situation. He knows the man that you need to influence. He said, this is not the time. We've got to work him over just a little bit more. Invite him to dinner. Okay, Lord, would you come to dinner? Oh, sure. She's at dinner. 
with her and with Haman and the king. Is it time now, Lord? Mm -mm. He needs a little more time, a little more time. Invite him to dinner one more time. And then on that third time, God said, go. And we know the story. It worked out. She used her superpower in a way that was pleasing to God, and she saved an entire nation. That is a super woman. Now, we got to go back to our, our girl Sarah, right? Because we have to understand the impact that can result from using your superpowers in ways that God never intended you to use them, right? Her decision, we know it impacted her in a bad way. But let's talk about the other people. Let's talk about Hagar. Hagar's not a bad girl, y'all. Because first of all, Sarah would have never chosen her to be the one if Hagar was disrespecting her, talking crazy. Hagar had to have been a good servant. She had to be for Sarah to trust her with this job, right? But now here you have Hagar. She's pregnant. And if you've been pregnant, you know, being pregnant is not the most fun thing. And Sarah's like, okay, handmaid, can you wash this? What's she asking me that for? Don't you see I'm pregnant? And I'm holding the promise child. I'm carrying the promise child. This is what's happening to Hagar. Hagar is also a victim of this situation. So she goes down that vein, right? Then you have Ishmael another innocent victim. He did nothing. And he comes into this earth, right? He's there for years before Isaac comes. And all he knows is, I'm the promised child. All these blessings are going to come through me. I'm daddy's favorite. And then here comes Isaac, and it's like, whoa, Isaac? So everything that I thought was my future is now being taken from me and given to him? And then you have Isaac. Another innocent party. Here he is. He's a little boy. Little kids are excited to be around their big siblings, right? Ishmael didn't want to be around Isaac. So now here Isaac, who did nothing, is sitting here being mistreated by an older brother who's a victim of circumstances that had nothing to do with them. That is what happens when we use our superpowers in ways that God never intended. And then you have Abraham. Abraham was the most jacked up. Here he is. I mean, he was. Think about it. He had peace. He didn't have a baby, but at least he had peace. Then when this whole Hagar thing comes, he is living in a war zone in his own house, dealing with two women who are going at it. Then he has Ishmael. Do we think that Abraham did not love Ishmael? He loved him. It was difficult for him to say, okay, you have to go away. What? You think about your children. Is it easy for you to say, I can't even imagine I said, God would have had to work with me because I'd be like, I, I can't do this one. You know what I mean? Just being real, like, I love my children. We love our children. So that was hard for Abraham. But the worst part about Abraham and the impact this thing had on him is that Abraham was called to be what? The father of the faithful. That's what God designed Abraham to be. He wanted him to be the father of the faithful. I want to read you what Ellen White says in Patriarchs of Prophets. It's on page 147, paragraph 2. She said, God had called Abraham to be the father of the faithful, and his life was to stand as an example of faith to succeeding generations. But his faith had not been perfect. He had shown distrust of God in concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife, and again in his marriage with Hagar, that he might reach the highest standard, God subjected him to another test the closest which man was ever called to endure. In a vision of the night, he was directed to repair to the land of Moriah and there offer up his son as a burnt offering upon a mountain that should be be shown him. You have to understand how God works. If God has a purpose for your life, he's going to keep testing you till you get exactly where he wants you to be. Abraham, I need you to be the example of faith. And you keep failing over and over and over again. You keep failing. And if you think about this thing, what if Sarah had a little more faith? What if Sarah went to God and said, God, help me use this superpower the way you want me to use it? What if when Abraham came to her the first time and was like, listen, girl, you're fine. I know if the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, if he sees you, he's going to kill me. We should just say that you're my sister and call it a day. Sarah could have said, Abraham, you're right. I am fine. But here's where you're wrong. 
Here's where you're wrong. We can trust God. God has called you to do something amazing. Do you think he's brought you this far to leave you? I believe in you. God believes in you. We can have faith. So let's go before Pharaoh boldly as husband and wife and see what God's going to do. If that had happened, we might be reading a different story about Abraham. Because a second time, it probably wouldn't have happened, right? And even more so, what about Isaac? Isaac did the same exact thing. If Sarah had used her superpower in a way that God intended it to be used. So, how are you using your superpower? How are you using, first of all, are you using it at all? Think about it. Are you using it at all? Just because he gave it to you does not mean you're using it. And if you are using it, are you seeking God first to make sure that your use of his power is aligned with his will? How many people have you led astray by your lack of faith? And this is not a beat-up thing. You know, I have to think about my own life, times when I wavered and my influence has not been what God wanted it to be. How have you impacted the lives of others? And this is not just a husband thing. This is everybody thing. Your influence impacts everybody. It impacts everybody. So I don't know about you, but I have, when I think about this thing and everything that the enemy does, and this whole superhero and superpowers, because you know, we all know, that there are forces that we can't see that are working overtime, doing some crazy stuff, right? Working on us, trying to win the battle for our souls. And I, for one, I'm not giving the devil my soul. I am sorry. He's got another thing coming. So if it means that I need to get on my knees and get aligned with God so I can be sure that I'm using the power that he's given me in the right way, then that's what I have to do. Because I want the enemy to look at me and say, whoa, and back up. We can't mess with her. Why? Because I'm wearing a cape that's flapping in the wind. The cape's not red. The cape is white. And on my chest, it's not an S for Superwoman or Simona. It's a J. Because I want to live my life in such a way that when the devil sees me, all he sees is Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he's going to back up, right? And then when Jesus comes to get us, I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful superwoman. And then, because I'm going, I hope you're going too, when I get to heaven and I'm standing at the sea of glass and I'm looking at the multitude that no man can number, I want to be able to look out there and see people who are there because my life and my superpower had an influence on their journey to Christ. Is that not what you want? So women of Pisgah, I've got to ask you, do we have some superheroes in the house today? Yeah. I don't care about yesterday. We're talking about right now. What decisions are we making? And this is for the men, too. Are we superheroes for Jesus? Amen. Absolutely. If you want to be a superhero for Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand. Right now, I'm going to tell you, the devil is angry. The devil is angry. And I want you to think twice before you watch another Marvel movie. I mean, honestly, y'all, it's foolishness. It's foolishness compared to the real battle that is going on. Yes, these angels, they have superpowers. And God says, look, in the last days, I need some people who are going to stand and fight for me. Put on your cape. Put on the J on your chest. But here's the deal. I want to give you more power. I want to give you more power. And I've got to read to you guys John 14, 12. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Do we know what Jesus did? Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus said, My word will not return unto me void. So if he says... If you lean on me, I'll give you power like the power that I had when I walked this earth. Not power for your own glory, but power to bring souls to Christ, to fight the evil in this universe. That's the kind of power I need in my life. Don't you need it? But God has to first trust us with the superpower he's already given us. Let's bow our heads. Yeah.